two-part title here because I want to talk about this in a slightly more general context. Um, so the second part is relating uh, simple and complex models. And I, I, I had the good fortune of talking about a model yesterday uh, that was in this vein, which is a, a torqued, a hip torqued and leg damped uh, model for which we looked at some fundamental issues involving how the stability changes once we add some torque and damping to slope. Uh, so I want to keep going in this vein of relating simple to complex models. Uh, some of you recall there's obviously many different ways we could go from a, a known model or result to something, let's say something like slope, because it is something that's established and there are a number of uh, solutions and experiments involving it. Okay? But we can extend that and improve the hypotheses in the models in various directions, as represented here by, um, by this colored uh, list of, of different directions. So let me give a couple more examples uh, before I get into the meat of, of my talk. So in, in, in regards to doing multiple-legged stuff, um, I've recently done some work looking at how something like a clock-torqued slip model um, could actually represent hexapetal locomotion. So if you, let's say you have a tripod model. What you can do, and, and what I've done here, is I've actually related the tripod model dynamics directly to the uh, template or CC slip model dynamics. And I'm doing that by using something that, that um, I'm calling, you know, just for lack of a better term, I'm calling it right now holistic analytic dis descriptions. And what that means is if you've got a model that has um, lots of parts in it, but you have some kind of whole body or whole system behavior, what you can do is try to describe that system behavior simultaneously in the whole system coordinates but then having internal uh, variable coordinates that take into account all the variations that are happening internally um, with respect to that whole body motion. So here's one example. Oh, let me go back. So here's one example. Um, so this mapping between these two uh, matrices, uh, what it shows you actually is, is how I can take a tripod uh, kinematic situation and describe it in terms of the same coordinates as I do for a tripod. And once I've done that, I can actually go ahead and uh, you know, derive the equations of motion using this description. That enables me to directly compare the differences in the dynamics between the tripod and the monopod. And that's what's being highlighted in those matrices in both the uh, orange and light blue blocks. It turns out that the, the different terms in the dynamic equations of motion if we perturb them in the different directions of motion, they give us a similar dynamic response. Uh, and that's what's, what, that's what's being shown. There are differences, and it depends on the, the morphological stuff. So what this also gives us is a way to embed the CT slip into the tripod. So we can use this mapping to make sure the tripod behaves like a CT slip if we want to, for example. Okay, so that's one example. Let me give you another one. So in terms of uh, doing multiple bodies, uh, so I've actually been doing backbending work for a while. Um, unfortunately, I kind of left it aside. I did some presentations in 2007, 2008, and I left it aside. And uh, more recently, I've been able to um, go ahead and publish it in conference papers at ASME 2011, 2012. Uh, as, as probably a lot of you know, there's, there's lots of other work going on with backbending as well. Um, so the approach that I've taken, again, is to try to use this analytic holistic description. I do think it has some advantages, okay, um, or holistic analytic description. So actually, let me first describe that, what's going on here. So in this case, you can see that there's a net center of mass uh, around uh, halfway between the center masses of the two bodies. So I can define the whole body kinematic situation, and I can make sure that when I derive, again, the equations of motion, that I'm using both the whole body variables and then these internal variables that are relative to the whole body coordinates. And for those of you that are interested, you can um, find those papers or you can email me and I'll send them to you. It's actually enabled me to come up with, with a couple uh, key insights into the behavior of these backbending systems. Um, there's some invariant manifolds which are kind of interesting. You, you might want to avoid those if you're a roboticist building one of these very quickly. Um, and then there's also some simplifications that help uh, come up with some tuning principles in terms of if you're going to uh, what kind of spring you're going to add, what kind of force. So here's just a video showing that another result was that passive stability is pretty easy to find in the system despite the existence of the backbending. Okay, so that's one, that's one result. Uh, if we look at a, a force situation, so we do something like clock torque slip again, 
we can use this uh, holistic analytic description to, to directly, explicitly embed that into our uh, whole body motion. And we can get stable behaviors. We can also uh, do forcing in the back. Um, and, and by the way, you know, just a, just a quick overview. I don't, when I've done this so far, there's obviously changes in stability when you add backbending. Um, there's obviously energetic consequences as well. Um, but you know, the changes in stability, from what I've seen, uh, have not been huge unless you get into particularly bad places in the parameter space. One of the hypotheses that I have is that backbending affords the opportunity to do a lot more power. So if you have actuators already in your back and you have muscles already there, and you're able to move your back, now you can do work and you can maybe accelerate more. Right, so that might be a key. Obviously, the stride length issues is another uh, key component that's pretty well established. But this model, I've also done a paper in terms of doing lateral backbending or, or um, lizard-like backbending. Now, again, the reason why I'm showing this is, is to show you that there's a bigger picture here in terms of the approach that I'm trying to develop and also the kind of thing that I'm trying to teach students um, that, are, that are at Purdue that are doing uh, some of these things. Um, that said, uh, we do have people in the lab that want to build these robots. I got a little bit of help. Um, we hacked some robots and we uh, just put a passive spring in the middle. And um, this is a bit of a teaser. I, I, I'm not going to show you all of that right now. But what I found here is actually the way that the robot behaves is actually pretty close to some of the key findings in the model. Uh, in particular, there's uh, we found one of the invariant manifolds or, or one of the motions that uh, is constant despite other dynamics that are happening. I found that in, in the uh, robotic platform. OK. Let me keep going. So here, what I really want to focus on uh, is this case of looking at forcing and damping that is like the above knee amputee case. Um, and because I want to go from simple models to more realistic ones, and in particular, I'm going to show you some musculoskeletal simulation. This idea <coughs> of mapping is a really simple model to relate it to a much more complex model is key. Right? It's it's everything for for this problem that that, that I want to solve. Um, and so we want to do this musculoskeletal simulation. And also, uh, again, at Purdue, uh, a student, Tim Sullivan, there is working on building a bipedal robot based on these principles as well. Um, but again, the motivation is to understand the robust locomotion dynamics and mechanics by studying the above knee amputee. Uh, these are passive knees. I, I don't actually know the details of, of, of these knees, but uh, it's remarkable. This person is actually um, trilateral. Uh, amputee, so he's missing one arm, right? And so through some process of learning, this person's able to be relatively robustly stable. And uh, I, I would presume relatively energetically, um, you know, not so bad, if you will, because you can go about running and doing various things without too much difficulty. Here's another above the knee amputee where the leg is rigid, but it acts like a spring. So in, in, in terms of going about simulating this, uh, there's clearly a gap again. So all the way on the left, we might have these reduced models. Uh, one of the things that's really good is in the whole body coordinates, the whole body description, these models have been able to predict um, fairly well some basic features of robust stability of locomotion. Okay? Probably better than the musculoskeletal <coughs> simulations. Um, I, I would say more than probably better. right? Uh, but one of the biggest problems is they're not anatomically accurate, and they're also not ready to, to, desu, you know, to, to design components for robots, so that's a problem. All the way on the right, we have these musculoskeletal simulations, which are clearly much more anatomically accurate. You can, make, you can look at forces and particular things of the component. That's great. And if you want to design robots, similar kind of thing. You want to be able to look at, those, at the details of those components. But so far, in the musculoskeletal world, there's been generally unstable whole body dynamics. So I should be able to finish up pretty quickly here. So because the hip-actuated slip models have performed pretty well, um, and I showed some of this stuff uh, yesterday, so I'll go through it pretty quick. Uh, in particular, this clock for a slip model, I'm going to embed this. Let me go back to that one video, just to show you that there's a version of it that also um, doesn't have the legs rotate up, up and over and around. So I'm going to embed this kind of model, and I'll go through the rest of this quickly. into the musculoskeletal simulation um, by taking special care of things like uh, the way that the leg is modeled. So I'm going to model the leg in a spring-like way to match the above knee amputee with a passive springy prosthetic device. Um, I'm going to do the clock torque uh, slip embedding in terms of the uh, hip control uh, torques. Um, so 
created a plugin, uh, personal derivative uh, control plugin for OpenSIM. Um, and that does what it says, right? It makes a control proportional to the error and a desired uh, leg angle. And there's also a, uh, a dissipative uh, term there for the angular velocity. And uh, here the trunk, at least currently, the trunk is not rotating, so it's just focusing on the sagittal uh, center of mass dynamics to compare those with the CD slip. And again, just to remind you, this is what we see, and then this is what the simulation does. This is a drop test where the, the system is going to be dropped. So it starts from a perturbed state, and you'll see pretty quickly it, it uh, goes on to a, a steady state kind of motion. So that demonstrates the stability and that drop test for running. This is a high clock frequency. If I do a low clock frequency, um, and now I'm starting from standing, and I just turn the system on, it can also stably transition pretty quickly to a walk cycle. And uh, that's it. I just want to acknowledge that, that I had some funding from NIH through this NCSRR Visiting Scholars Program out at Stanford, and Scott Delp and uh, students and staff there were, were very helpful in all of that. And of course, working with my, my students at the <coughs> All right, thank you very much. So basically, in that model, actuation is required to get some kind of kinematically effective background of the fuel. So then I moved to, to that phase. And the other question was whether the clock in that model and perhaps other models, if that clock is absolute time or phase dependent. So far, you know, just because I'm, I'm not so much in that world of whether time or phase is, is the key, I've just focused on absolute time. My sense in these models with playing, with playing with them in an exploratory sense is that they can accomplish this in a phase um, domain as well. I just don't know for sure. So, thanks. Yes? Um, you mentioned that your construct is kind of a model uh, that's pro being anatomically accurate. Why would you want, uh, well, why would that be listed as a pro anatomically accurate uh, model? Is it because Right, so I mean, in, in, in a general modeling sense, the advantage for having a good model of your constituent parts, of your components, is that then you get accurate information about those components, both geometrically and then in the sense of what, how we usually think about anatomy, but also once you have that kinematic or geometric description, then you know how the forces and ener energies are flowing, you get stresses, and now you can do all kinds of uh, cool medical applications and uh, engineering design stuff. So, yeah. any other questions? So, actually, I actually have a question. So, when you said holistic analytic, yeah, sure. sort of like, are you saying like shape space and group space, or what's? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I understand um, that well enough to, to say. I, I'm just using the terms holistic and analytic just because in common English they have some meaning, right? The holistic meaning, again, a whole body um, description, and then the analytic part. Does that mean like the position orientation of some part of the center of mass? Or some yeah, it's, yeah, so, or? yeah, so for example, on this diagram here, what, I would, what I'm trying to do is because we have a whole body motion of, let's say, the whole body center of mass, we can have a description of that, so that's the holistic part. The analytic part would then be uh, having that description simultaneously be explicit while there's um, relative variables to that variable. So all the other variables would be relative to that one as an internal analytic description of what's going on inside of the whole body, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Any, anything else? Otherwise, 
Yeah, Andy. <laughs> something good going on in the, in the whole body variables like you're controlling that but then you've got these extra uh, degrees of freedom that are doing something what, what do you do with that some people um, go about trying to restrict those um, constrain those in such a way that they're, they become unimportant to the whole body problem and I, I may not be paraphrasing all the proposals right I, I don't know if I have a strong position on that what I've done so far actually is uh, I think I've relied on some of the passive dynamics of some of those internal variables where they just they haven't been much of a problem so far in what I'm doing, so I'm not actually going about doing um, uh, really intensive control of those variables. So from that point of view, I haven't really developed a particular approach to that aspect, the control aspect of them. I've just been trying to get the whole body stuff. That, if that seems to work, then I haven't been worrying about those. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, well, excellent. Appreciate that. Okay. Dr. Finkel, before you break the coffee, wait, please. Before you um, break the coffee. Just a quick announcement for those who missed breakfast, we have more food out for you. <laughs>